Here I am. Take the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you stand is holy ground. Who are you? I am that I am. I don't understand. I am the god of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their cry. Stop it! Leave that man alone! So I have come down to deliver them out of slavery and bring them to a good land. A land flowing with milk and honey. And so unto Pharaoh I shall send you. Me? Who am I to lead these people? They'll never believe me. They won't even listen. I shall teach you what to say. Let my people go! But I was their enemy. I was the prince of Egypt, the son of the man who slaughtered their children. You've, you've chosen the wrong messenger. How, how can I even speak to these people? Who made man's mouth? Who made the deaf, the mute, the seeing, or the blind? Did not I? Now go! Well, good morning and welcome. You know what? I'm, I'm going to watch that movie this afternoon. All the feels. I love that movie. Not often does Hollywood kind of get it right, but in that one, I really like it. Good morning. My name is Roger. I'm the teaching pastor here at Uptown Community Church. For those of you who are visiting, I know we have a couple of visitors with us this morning. I want to say welcome. Uh, this morning, I want to do two things. So you guys know how much I hate New Year's resolutions. So... I thought maybe this morning what we would do is we'd have a conversation a little bit about fear and about where, uh, what, what 2024 can look like for us. And then also I want to talk a little bit about UCC and talk a little bit about who we are as a church as well too. And maybe kind of some thoughts about where we're going to go this next year as well. So I, I called my sermon this morning, Beyond the Jordan. And don't worry, next week we're going to get back to the book of Hebrews. And we're going to finish up the book of Hebrews. And we've only got a, a few weeks left on that. But... I want to maybe talk to you about uh, what, it looked, what it must be like to be somebody God chooses to do something that is so far outside of your comfort zone. But before we do that, let's talk about passive Christianity, because why not? Uh, John Blue had this great article called Passive Christianity is Dead Christianity, and he says this, what do you want? What do you desire? What is your ambition? Do you really want to know? Look at your behavior. 
You do what you want. This is a devastatingly simple psychology of motivation. What's interesting is, is oftentimes Christians can say things like, you know, I want more of God, or I want to live my life for God, or we use all these grandiose terms. But what he's saying here is kind of interesting. He's saying that no, no matter what we say, what we do actually shows the, the true nature of our heart. He's, he goes on to show this. He says, but this is also what the Bible teaches. James, faith without works is dead. Don't tell me you have faith if the way you live doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, back up what you say. John, love without deeds is dead. Don't tell me you have love if, you, if, you lived, uh, if your life doesn't back up what you say. Paul, grace without holiness is dead. Don't tell me you revel in God's grace if, you've, if, if the way you live doesn't uh, back up the what you say. And of course, Jesus, discipleship without obedience is dead. Don't tell, me you're, don't tell me I'm your Lord if the way you live doesn't back up what you say. And what's interesting about this is that it's kind of one of those things that we think about and we don't ta- say a lot of. So Christianity's kind of gotten stuck within this idea of faith and works. Right, And so for oftentimes people will say, well, oh, you know, I am saved by grace. And that is 100% true. And just to be clear, I'm not saying otherwise. However, it's within that idea of grace that we've forgotten that there's actually things for us to accomplish. That our, our, our faith isn't just meant to be this, yes, I'm saved by grace. But the reality is, is even the idea of salvation is this idea of like a kind of a, a label. I am saved. But saved for what? Saved to what? Um, he goes on to say this. Um, Christians must be graciously aggressive when it comes to the way we live. Words like striving, straining, self-denial, fighting, whatever it takes, and courage are not for our lips only. They are words of behavioral action, and they're the words of grace, not wor- uh, not works righteousness. So what I love about John, what he's saying, and I think what the, what the Bible says as well too, is when we think about what God has done in our lives, we think about salvation, we think about grace, these are all beautiful, wonderful concepts, but the overflow of that, right? The overflow of that should be changed behavior. It should be a changed life. And I would say to you that perhaps what we have kind of got ourselves stuck into a little bit is this idea that I'm saved, but that means I'm just, I'm cozy, right? Um, and we talked about this before, but maybe we say, I'm saved, I'm, I'm not going to hell. Well, that's a good thing, but is that the only thing? Um, yesterday on our social media, I asked this question. When was the last time you tried something that scared you? You know what's interesting about being an adult? Is you get to say no a lot and no one can tell you otherwise. Right? I want to have cake for breakfast. Okay, that seems like a fantastic idea. Uh, I want to sleep in. I want to do this. I want to do that. And as an adult, you get to go, yeah. And no one's going to go, well, maybe that's not the best idea for you. I just realized something over the last little bit is that as I was talking to people and having conversation with people, we, we talk a little bit about this at UCC a little bit. It's this idea of comfort zones. Right? We love our comfort zones. And why wouldn't we? Who wants to be uncomfortable? But what's uncomfortable about being comfortable is this idea that there's this idea of uh, rot or apathy can kind of, um, kind of take uh, residence in, that, in, in our spirits a little bit. And so I was thinking about this, even in my own life, right? When's the last time I did something that scares me? When's the last time I tried to accomplish something that actually was outside of my comfort zones, completely unqualified for? Like, when's the last time I tried to do that? And so what was interesting is I, when I think about this particular type of an idea, I automatically go to this guy named Moses. And so this morning, I want to take a look at Moses' life as kind of the springboard to what I want to talk about. Because Moses, this poor guy, I swear to you, like, his life is kind of a, uh, like, like this opera, right? So on the one hand, he's placed in this basket, and all the Hebrew children are being slaughtered. He is spared. And not just spared, he's found by the Pharaoh's daughter, right? Um, uh, I, I talked to this one guy, he, uh, he grew up in a, a group home, he was an orphan. And uh, he said, you know, when he was a kid, he used to read the Moses story and just think to himself, what if I got adopted by somebody really rich? You know, and he goes, you know, you don't realize this, but like, you know, when you're, you're, when you're, uh, you know, you're, when you're trying to be adopted and you're kind of aware of what adoption is, as, as, as like a young person, like he was, I think he was like eight or nine at this point in time. And he was saying that, you know, people would come in and, you know, <laughs> I don't want to say kick the tires of, of orphans, but that's the idea, right? And so they would try to make themselves cute or, 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 or something like that. And I thought, wow, that's an, it's a perspective that I, I never thought of. But he goes, the Moses story was one I always clung to, right? Because we always wanted Pharaoh's daughter to come in. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get that, right? So here's Moses. He, he gets adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, and he gets the best of the best. 
right? He gets the best of the best, like, like the food, the education, all of that, right? But in one fell swoop, by killing someone's life, a fellow Egyptian, his life is, is turned upside down. And then he becomes a sheep herder for the next X amount of years, right? Like we're talking about extremes here. And then one day, God shows up to Moses and has this conversation with him. And, you know, in the video clip you saw there, but basically it's Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, God says this to Moses. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So what I love about this is there's these two tensions happening here, right? On the one hand, Moses is being confronted by God, and unmistakably so. Right? Like, like the burning bush, all that's going on there, like this is obviously supernatural. This is ab- above and beyond my understanding, right? So he knows this is God. But he's also realizing, too, that maybe he's not the best person for this. That maybe he's not for this. You know, when you look at the Bible, it, there's a theme within it, especially in the Old Testament, about this concept of the promised land. And actually, if you look in the Bible, and you'll see, uh, if you, if you kind of um, chart through when this is first mentioned, the first time this idea of the promised land is mentioned is actually in Genesis chapter 12. So this idea of, of, of God preparing a place for his people is one of the most ancient promises in the Bible, and, and God develops it through a whole series of ways. So in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And so in Genesis chapter 12, Abram, we believe, is probably, uh, probably uh, the northern part of Egypt. That's what we believe, right? And so by the gets to chapter 13, he travels from there, and he goes to what would become Israel. And in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 13, God says this to him. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are, to the north and the south, to the east and the west. All the land you see, I will give you, give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram is the first person to walk into this thing called the promised land. So what's interesting about Israel is it's not just a country, it's actually kind of a, it's a, a very sacred right that the Jewish people have with this land. And as I said before, and I'll, I'll re- say again, no other people on the earth can, can claim this. None. There is nobody else on earth that has such a unique uh, tie to the land. And this is obviously why, as we see what's going on in the Middle East right now, Israel is, and I am astounded by um, people's response as far as like uh, Jewish people's rights to kind of ex- even just exist. But it's like we can't understand how important this land is. And what I love about this as well too is that if you look at Israel on a map, it is like a sliver. It's literally a sliver. And you can literally walk from both points of it. Take some time, but you can do that. Right? And so what's interesting is when God says to Moses, this is what I want for you. This is, this is what I want for my people. We go, oh, okay, this is God's intention. Whitney Woodward, uh, she has this idea of what the promised land means to the people. She says this, The promised land plays an important role in the Bible. It's a major biblical theme introduced in the book of Genesis and developed all throughout the Bible, even into the Bible's final book, Revelation. The Hebrew Bible specifically shines a spotlight on this divine gift by showing God's people cycling in and out of the land, caught in a pattern of rebellion against God. This land that God promised to Abraham all the way back to Genesis is not simply a geographical backdrop. It acts as a picture of covenant faithfulness as God's people try and often fail to live out their divine calling. So when you look at this idea of Israel, when you look at this idea of the promised land, we know that um, based upon how the people were responding towards God, whether it was idolatry, worshiping of other gods, foreign nations would come in, right? And we see this kind of culminate when Babylon comes in and finally just destroys Israel and takes into what's called the Babylonian exile for 70 years, the best of the best. This is where we get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and and, and the book of Daniel is written, right? This is what we call the exile. So the promised land is not something to be taken for granted. Now, fast forward to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is, and I know you may think this is of me, but this is the world's longest sermon. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 5. Now, it's important to note here. Remember I said to you before that when the Bible gives you a certain detail, there's a reason for it, 
okay? Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 5 says this, East of the Jordan, in the territory of Moab, Moses began to expound this law, saying, so the reason why the writer tells you this is because they are on the other side of the Jordan River. They have not yet crossed over into the promised land. So before they do so, Moses is going to give them one heck of a sermon, right? That's the entirety of the book of Deuteronomy is Moses' last sermon to them. Now remember, one of the reasons why Moses is giving this really long sermon as well too is because he's not going into the promised land. He has been negated from that because of his previous act in the wilderness, so this is Moses' final act. Now look at this in verse 6 to 8. The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites, and to Lebanon, as far as the great river Euphrates. See, I've given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land. The, uh, the land swore he would give to you, your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Now, what's important about this is that Deuteronomy is kind of the rules that's going to govern this land. So when Israel goes into the promised land, they are taking with them this idea of how God wants them to operate. He, they're taking with them this idea of the law, right? And this is kind of the, uh, the, the ancient uh, foundation of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus was going to kind of expound upon as well. But it's, it first finds its foundation in the promised land. Now, what's important as well too, and Joshua brings this up in Joshua chapter 24, is that while Israel was in Egypt, they were worshiping other gods in there. One of the reasons why God takes Israel out of Egypt is because he realizes that Egypt has been infecting them with their, with their religions. And so he takes them out of there. And so in Joshua chapter 24, it says this. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable too, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods the Amorites in, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's a beautiful, beautiful image, right? When we think about whatever lies beyond the Jordan River for the people of Israel, it was unknown. It was a promise. It was an idea. God says to Israel, I want you to take the promised land. Now, it's occupied, by the way, so you're going to have to fight for it as well, too. And, 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 and they do so. To a certain degree, they actually fail in a whole bunch of ways. But that's, that, you know, spoiler alert, we won't get to that part yet. But the idea is this. Moses was tapped by, uh, by God on the shoulder to say, hey, I need you to take my people here. And along the way, I'm going to teach you what it means to be covenant, covenant dwellers of my covenant. Now, imagine for a moment, you're on the other side of the Jordan River. Now, we don't know exactly where they crossed over, and we can't really have a good sense of the Jordan, but we do know that it was pretty deep and I, I, I was trying to find a, a commentary that gave me a width of it, and I couldn't find anything of it. But this is the second time in the Bible that God's going to stop water so that people can walk across. And that's exactly what happens at the Jordan. You're walking across the Jordan. There's hundreds of thousands of you because, you know, in the desert, you guys have been living as a, as, as a nation and children have been born and all that. And you're walking across the Jordan into the promised land. Like, what's going through your mind? What is actually happening before you? Now, the reason I kind of use this idea of, of, um, of the Jordan is because for me, this is what the New Year feels like, right? Now, I've told you before, I don't like New Year's resolutions. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of them because they don't really work, right? They just, we have this idea that, oh, January 1st, I'm going to make this decision to be this individual, and by the end of January, it's like, forget about it, right? And I, and I get that. But what I do like about January 1st, and this is what I will say to you, is that it can be a symbol of some sort of ideal or transformation that you are trying to figure out, right? Now, but they have found out that if you're going to make a New Year's resolution of any kind, the best way to do so is in a group of people, so that people can keep each other accountable and not just a singular person. So a metaphor means that something is a symbolic of, and the promised land was symbolic of something. But there's a part of the promised land that we forget about. And the, problems, the, problem, uh, the promised land is this idea that's not just simply, okay, here's where you need to go. Because 
what is about interesting about the promised land, and Paul Nash says this, and I really like what he has to say about it. He says this, the promised land always lies on the other side of the wilderness. Now, why I like that idea and why I want to use this as a springboard to talk a little bit about UCC this morning is because when we think about 2024, what does God have for us this year? See, we think we know what this year holds for us. We think we know that this is what's going to happen this year, but we don't. We have no idea what 2024 holds for us. We have no idea what joys could be ahead of us, new relationships, uh, something. But we also don't know about any sorrow that might be awaiting us as well, too. Loss of relationships, perhaps. So 2024 is kind of like a blank canvas. It's like the idea of the promised land. right? We know that God has called us for this. We know that God is saying, hey, wherever you go, I'm with you. Right? And these are the covenant rules that I want you to live out your life in, in this next year. And so what I thought I wanted to do is talk, to kind of review a little bit about who we are as a church. Now, I realize at UCC that when I first planted UCC eight and a half years ago now, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm that old now, um, there were some ideas that we talked about at the very beginning here. And I want to kind of refresh your memory on them because I want to kind of use these as kind of a way of springboarding off to what we want to talk about in the future. So when I first planted UCC, I had this really dumb diagram. And what I mean by diagram is, is that it was a way of talking about what were the values of UCC? What was, what was going to be important for us as a community? And so I came up with three ideas, word, worship, and community. And for some of you who have been part of UCC for a while, you will recognize these words. The idea behind it is that these words were going to be kind of, these values were going to be kind of how we would dictate ourselves as a church. Now, what's interesting about us as a church is that I, I don't think we're that different from other churches, but we do approach things a little bit differently in the sense that we don't, we don't try to emulate other churches, and we don't try to emulate our culture. Right, so we talk about this all the time with, in, with regards to our, our, how we kind of operate, like even just our worship services, right? Our worship teams put together, uh, you know, and I, and I believe each, a, each worship leader puts together a worship service. They pick the songs out, they practice, and they, and they present them to us. And then we as a congregation, right, we, we sing along, but we don't just sing along, right? Because our worship at UCC, we try as much as possible to engage our minds as well too. We want you to think about the words. We want you to not just to have this, oh, like it's a spiritual jukebox. Um, I'm happy with the worship service because I know the songs or this is the latest song or that song there or, or, or whatnot. But instead, we believe the songs we choose are going to lead us towards God. And so that's up to us to be able to kind of say, okay, we want to make sure that we're focused and, and, and listening into that. So word worship and community, and I want to kind of review to you what these words mean. But not just what they mean as well too, but where they come from. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. So remember we talked about the promised land with Moses? This is kind of the promised land for the church. Because Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, is the very beginning of this thing we call church. And the Bible gives us this snapshot, this brief, brief glimpse at what this early community is going to look like. Now, just so you know, it's going to get worse from here. But at one shining moment, this group of people had figured it out. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Not 27, 47. It says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possession to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. So remember, Acts chapter 2 is taking place right after the day of Pentecost sermon by uh, Peter, right? And remember, this is, the this is one of the greatest altar calls in history. 3,000 people come to faith in this day. So whatever the number of Christians were, right, the upper room, or whatever they were, we get another 3,000 God-fearing Jews added to that number. And from there, they all get together and say, okay, who's this Messiah? What's this Jesus guy all about? Talk to us about the kingdom. What's, this, what's going on here, right? And the apostles and those who are kind of early adopters of Christianity are kind of teaching this group what it means to be a Christ follower. And so the reason I love this, uh, this passage is because for me, whatever the church was supposed to be and whatever the church is supposed to be today it kind of comes back to this right here. So I've been a pastor for over 25, oh my goodness, 
25 years. I'm old, apparently. Um, I, I've been a pastor for over 25 years now. And what's interesting is I've been a pastor in different kind of contexts, different denominations even. And what's interesting to me is, and if I can be honest with you for a second, church is one of those things that can either be something that is so wonderful or so horrible, right? It can either give us so much life or it can be very painful. And I know there's a lot of people who are in churches today or Christians who bear a lot of scars from churches. I understand that. And I see what churches are like becoming today and, and the politics and all the kind of stuff that's going on right now. And I think to myself, you know, it's so unfortunate that we have kind of forgotten what we are supposed to be. And so for me, I always kind of come back to this and kind of go, okay, so this is what we were. So the three values, word, worship, and community, came out of this idea and said, okay, so what does it look like for me? So when we talk about this idea about word, you guys know that UCC is very much a Bible teaching church. And what I mean by that is that I feel that my responsibility as your pastor, as your teaching pastor, is to help you to understand the Bible. Now, I don't mind if you reject it. I don't mind if you disagree with me. I don't mind if you go, why, well, you know, whatever, whatever you want to say about it. That's fine. All I want to give you is the context for the Bible. That's one of the reasons why we talk so much about the Jewish aspect of Scripture, right? Because I want you to understand at least, you can, uh, you can understand and reject, but at least I want you to understand. And so with the tension of the word there, what it is is idea of living and learning. Now, here's the reason for that. And right in between that is the tension. So on the one hand, I want you to learn about the Bible, but I want you to live these ideals in your life every day. See, the problem is, is that if you can, there's, there's, um, there's people who know lots about the Bible, but perhaps their lives don't reflect the characters and the values of that. And so what I wanted for UCC as much as possible is that the tension of learning about God's word, but also living out these values in the world today, these two tensions are going to kind of keep us in balance. Right? So that we're not just simply looking at the one or the other. And, I, and, and it was actually Augustine uh, that I really, uh, I really enjoyed a couple of his readings on this. It says this. The Bible was composed in such a way that as beginners mature, its meaning grows with them. So what I love about the Bible is that you could be a brand new Christ follower and you can start reading it and you can get so fascinated by it and going, oh, okay. But you could be a Christ follower for 50 years. And you're still learning. You're still discovering. You're still going, wow, I didn't know that, or I didn't see that, or I didn't have that understanding of what was going on here. So what's interesting about, uh, about the Bible is that you will never outpace the depths of what's already in there. And I think it's interesting is that when we get to heaven, we'll get the official, you know, Jesus commentary on the Bible, and we'll see all the stuff we've missed. Right? It's like, oh, okay, I get it, right? There's so much, so much more going on here. So when it talks about this idea of what, UCC was supposed to be, is that we were first, first and foremost, is we were going to take the Bible seriously. Um, uh, a guy named Kenneth Birding, uh, he's a New, New Testament professor, says this about the Bible. He says, people don't consider the Bible to be authoritative. That is, they don't consider the Bible to place a claim on their lives. They may consider the Bible to be important in a general sort of way, but this is a far cry from believing that God has communicated his will through this book, and therefore it's binding upon our actions. Now, what reason I love this quote so much is because I'm encountering Christians today who are, are, are like modifying the Bible. Right? And by modifying the Bible, I mean something like, you know, oh, the Bible isn't, you know, that was for back then. Or this, is, this, this part of the Bible is mythology. Or, or this is just for Jewish people. Or these rules are only for the ancient world, but not really for the modern world today. And you know what? I understand that, that, that impulse, but it always terrifies me. Right? I said this before, right? If you start using a Sharpie to get rid of stuff in the Bible you don't like, the question is, where do you stop? Right? Where do you stop? So one of the things that's always been unique about UCC, and I say unique, but I, I, like I, you guys who have been part of UCC know this, we take the Bible seriously. And by that, we simply mean that however we look at it, we, re, we believe the Bible to be true. And not just true is like, oh, it's, it, it's true for my heart, but it's, no, no, it's actually people in real places, in real time, that God has intervened at certain points there to teach. And we see this all over the place. That's why there's parts of the Bible that I'll teach on that are really uncomfortable, but I'm not going to avoid the topic either, though, because it's not for me to edit the Bible. 
And so we sometimes will have that, that, that tension of like, ooh, this part of the Bible really feels uncomfortable, especially my Western, you know, kind of whatever. I'm like, okay, I, I get that, but there's a reason God put it in there. And so we at UCC, we talk about this a lot and say, okay, we want to make sure that we are a church, uh, apart from anything else that we are, is that we actually take the Bible seriously and kind of um, it's, it's incumbent upon us to study it and kind of learn more about it. When we talk about this idea of worship, there's two aspects of it, right? There's this idea of singing and serving. Uh, Deslin Kennebrew, uh, uh, this um, African commentator, uh, theologian that I, I really enjoy, says this. Worship is not the slow song that the choir sings. Worship is not the amount you place in the offering basket. Worship is not volunteering in the children's church. Yes, these may be acts of expressions of worship, but they do not define what true worship really is. There are numerous definitions of the word worship, yet one in particular encapsulates the priority we should give to worship as a spiritual discipline. Worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. See, one of the things that makes U- UCC unique as far as our worship services is that, it, you know, if anybody ever reads our updates, at the very top of it says this, welcome to UCC. We are not here to entertain you. We're not here to go, ah, like, like here, here's all the lights and cameras show and all that about this. That's not our job here, right? And if that's what you're looking for, we're probably not going to be the church for you for that. But what we are trying to do as much as possible is create an atmosphere of worship. But not just worship, it's singing, because worship is everything. You know, I could, I could talk about the Westminster Catechism, where it says that everything is worship. And I know it's kind, of a, it's kind of a weird thing to think about, but I don't know if they're, I actually think they actually might be right on that. If everything is worship, then everything that we live in our lives, every way that we look at our lives, is not just simply about saying, you know what, I want to sing some songs, I want to sing the latest this or latest that, or I'm going to do that, or, or I, need, I need this to, to worship. But worship is this expression of the heart. It's an expression of our spirits. So if everything is worship, then what we do, how we work, how we live with our friends, our family, in our workplaces, in our schools, wherever we find ourselves, everything is worship. Um, uh, Deslin goes on to say this true worship in other words is defined by the priority we place on who God is in our lives and where God is in our list of priorities true worship is a matter of the heart expressed through a lifestyle of holiness thus if your lifestyle does not express the beauty of, the, of holiness through an extravagant or exaggerated love for God you do not live in extreme or excessive submission to God then I invite you to make worship a non-negotiable priority in your life see What's interesting about worship and this idea of how we worship, and again, not just worship as singing, but one of the ways that the Bible defines worship is actually serving. So when you look at the Bible, there's about six words the Bible uses for worship. Two of those six words are actually service. And so that's why at UCC, we try as much as possible to invest in our community. That's why we invest at Ray of Hope. And you know, what's well, you know what I love about our church as well, too? There's many of you here in this room that have your own things that you do on your side. And that's absolutely as it should be. Right? It's, not for, it's not for us as a church to say, this is what you should do, but it's the expression of your lives in every aspect of your lives that you just are automatically just finding places in your life to kind of serve the Lord and kind of exemplify what that looks like. And so worship is, uh, is an important aspect of it, but we define it differently. And of course, we come to community. Community is kind of an interesting one because there's a, uh, this, this quote here, it's anonymous, it was in this uh, long kind of article, but this idea of community has kind of gotten this kind of weird uh, how people look at it today. Uh, let me read this quote first, it's this, let's be honest, everyone wants to belong. Everyone wants to walk into a room and have a warm welcome. Norm! From Cheers for those of you who might be old enough. But here is the reality behind that feeling. You can't belong if you don't belong. Belonging takes work. It's not instantaneous, much to our dismay. Belonging means that we matter and that we have a place that we fit into and that if we don't fill that space, we would be missed. And in that description is what we all long for, but the reality is it takes two to to belong. See, a lot of people today are are lonely in our culture, and I understand that. I see it all the time. And people want a place to belong. But what you have to understand, though, is that belonging isn't just simply, here I am. Right? Hopefully, as much as possible, when you walked into UCC or, or part of UCC, wherever that might have been, someone said hello to you. And, and that, you know, like hopefully that you feel that because we're kind of a smaller church that you, you know, you, people are going to say hello and, and kind of get to know you. But guess what? We're not going to pounce on you. We're not going to say, hey, we want you to work, uh, you know, uh, uh, volunteer in the kids program or be on sound or whatever. We're going to give you a little bit of time. 
get to know us a little bit, kick our tires a little bit before we kind of figure out whether we are a good place to kind of actually stay. But if you do stay, realize something. This is a community that actually loves each other. Of all the things, of all the values we got, uh, uh, that, that we, we, we have at UCC, the community piece, I think we do get pretty good. For those of you who are on the retreat, right? When we came home from the retreat, we were gone for an entire weekend together. It was like, I, 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 like, it was like heaven on earth. It was so great, right? You get to hang out with people, seeing the kids having fun, all of that. Again, different ages and stages, all interacting with each other. It was awesome. Right? But community takes time. And it's not just simply instantaneous. The other thing about UCC that's kind of weird as well, too, is we, we like to be something called a, a low-resource footprint. Now, what that means is simply this. At Uptown Community Church, we want to take the resources that God's given us, and we want to use those in such a way that we don't actually use it to kind of build up this kind of edifice, but instead, we want to use it to be able to say, hey, this is how we want to use our resources. Right? So when you look at our yearly budget, it's actually pretty small. Um, I, I, was t I was talking to a pastor, and he's like, that's how much you guys spend in a year? I'm like, yeah. He's like, that's our church in two months. And I'm like, you guys waste a lot of money. Um, but we don't like to, as much as possible, uh, spend money on stuff that's not important. A lot, of way we sp way, a lot of the ways that we spend money is based upon people and, 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 and interaction with each other. And the reason for that is because we believe that the way that we use our resources is, A, we have to pay rent here. That's obvious, right? And our rent always goes up like everybody else's rent is. So as you feel that pain, we do as well too, right? Um, so our, our, our rent is there as well too. But wherever we use our resources, we want to make sure it's about relationships. So if you look at it here on the list here, the majority of the ways we spend money as far as our meetings, our young adults, and all that kind of stuff, it's for, it's for interaction and connections, right? It's for people to connect with other people. Now, why do we do that? It's because we don't think that we should be spending money on stuff that's not important. Now, the obvious thing is that, as like any church, we ha our equipment breaks down. We had to replace a laptop because it just wasn't working anymore. So these things happen, and that's just part of the way it goes. But as much as possible... We don't want anyone to be thinking that, we you know, UCC is trying to, you know, Pastor Rogers going on a, on a uh, pastor's retreat in Hawaii. I love when pastors do that. You know, oh, yeah, we're going to this pastor's retreat. Just so you know, here's a little fun fact. Too. They don't usually show up at these places. They just go and have fun, right? It's, and, and, you know, I, I, I get that. But one of the things as well, too, about the staff part of us is with the staff, just so you know, all of us staff have other jobs. So I'm paid uh, three-quarter time. But then I also have other jobs, as you guys know. Uh, I work at a technology company as well, too. And I have since day one. Since day one, I have, I've always had a job at UCC. Now, the other staff that we have here all have other jobs as well, too. And the reason for that is not just because I, um, I want you to pay me more or less, but it's because I also want to have a mission in being in the community as well, too. Like, I've... I know this is going to sound like a horrible thing to say. And if you're visiting for the first time, please forgive me what I'm about to say here. But hanging around Christians 24-7 really bothers me. It, it really does. Want to know why? Nothing challenges me about that. But in the, in the world that I have found myself, I have found myself having these fascinating conversations with people who have never gone to church, who have no idea what Christianity is all about. And the fact they find out that I'm a brown pastor freaks them right the heck out. And going, tell me about this. I'm like, absolutely. Let's have this conversation. What I love about having a job outside of this, and so actually it's funny, I was on a podcast uh, two weeks, three, a month ago? So this is a podcast on church planning in Canada called Sowers. And so I was a guest on there a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we were talk, they were, the, the interviewer was talking to me about, uh, about what, I, what I do. And the reason why he wanted to talk to me uh, uh, about me is, is this idea of co-vocation or what we call bivocational. And he, we were talking about this idea of like, why do I do it? Right? Like, why do I do it? And I said the exact same thing I just said to him as, as, as I said to you as well too. I do it. Because I want to get out in the world. I want to have conversations with people who are not Christians. I want to be able to help them to understand that whatever they think of Christianity, whatever the news and media tells them about what a Christ follower is, it actually is a little bit different. And that there's some, some kind of normal people out there that are Christ followers. So don't believe the news and just understand that. So when we talk about this idea of low resource footprint, at UCC, we want to make sure that whatever resources God gives us, 
it's not going to, to me or, or to any of the staff. It's not going to anything here. That's why we love renting a space. Because whatever happens to this space, it's not our problem. When the roof leaks, that's the owner's problem, not ours. When the furnace goes, again, their problem, not ours. We just rent the space. And again, that's a great way for us to kind of make sure that we're using our resources wisely. So we always want to be a low resource footprint. We talk about levels of engagement at UCC. And, and we talk about time, talent, and treasure. You know what's interesting about our church? Is that if you were to break down the percentage of volunteers. So I was having this conversation with somebody who goes to, um, uh, how do I say this? It goes to a different church. It's a larger church. But uh, they just released their stats within their church about their volunteerism. And, he, and, and according to what he was telling me, it, of the people who go to this church, only about 4 to 7% of people volunteer. That this church, which is close to 2,000 people, it's only about 120 volunteers that actually make this whole place run. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He goes, so what's, what's your percentage of your church? And I've never really sat down and thought about it. But as I look around this room, I'm pretty sure all of you have some sort of things that you do here. And I said, and I was just being kind of, kind of being silly. I said, I don't, I don't know, it's about 70%. He's like, what? I'm like, okay, wait, let me think about this for a second. And so I'm like, uh, and actually, yeah, it's about 70% of, of everybody in our church actually serves in some capacity at some place. Right? Engagement's important, right? This community here relies upon the kindness of strangers. And not just strangers, but basically each one of us gets to go to each other and say, hey, we want to serve, we want to help out in some way. So we talk about our time, right? Our time is our finite uh, resource. It is, it is our priority list, right? So when you have your week looks ahead of you, you go, okay, what do I have to do? What do I not have to do? Time is your first one. The secondary one is your talent. That's the abilities that God's given you whether it's for worship, whether it's our tech, our cafe team, our kids team, right? Whatever it might be, we have people. We have our young adult leadership as well, too. We have our young adults. We have small group leaders as well, too, right? When I think about all the different people who uh, serve in different capacities, right, these are us taking what God has given us and giving them back to what it would have. And, of course, our last one is our treasure. Right? I, as I shared to you before, I don't want you to contribute to UCC if you don't really think that we as a church are doing the best that we can with what God's given us. But I just want to let you know something. Our low resource footprint, it's really served us well. Because as many churches have had felt this pinch of kind of like, okay, we have to make, we have to, we have to do uh, more with less, we're like just, we're just ticking along just fine. Why? Because we, we, we have certain resources we need to be able to use, but God's provided people in this church that are faithful for us as well too. And so, we're, 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 we're good that way. So time, talent, and treasure. And so what that looks like is this. Is this is the movement into community. So when you show up here on a Sunday morning, it doesn't mean you're part of our community. It just means you're here. And welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. But the next step into really getting involved is getting involved. Somewhere, somehow, some way. But again, that's after a while. That's after you've kicked the tires, kind of going, you know what? You know, the guy at the front talks about fast. Talks a bit longer, but apart from that, okay. I, 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 like, the, I like the vibe. I like the vibe. The, the church has passed my vibe test. Uh, and so, yeah, I think, I think, I think this is going to be good. I, 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 can, I can dig in here. Then the next step is we want, we'd love for you to find a place to serve. And, of course, the last part is, and this is, this is when you know you're really committed, and that's when you go, you know what? Not only do I want to serve here, not only do I want to come here, but I also want to take the resources that God's given me, and I want to use that for his kingdom. See, just so you know, at our church, we don't, some churches get, get a little bit, you know, churches either get really hyper about money, you got her, right? And other churches are kind of like embarrassed by, well, you know, we don't want time. That's my cheery side impression, by the way. We're more in like the middle. We're more in the middle of saying, you know what? If you want, if you want, if you believe what we do here, we'd love for you to contribute. If, but if you don't, that's fine too. Right? And so we have this idea of saying, you know what? This is the lev levels of engagement. Each area is a part of our lives that we are surrendering to God. Right? And that's the thing about discipleship. 
right? We're not looking for converts here. We're not looking for, for fans. We're looking for people to be discipled. And by discipleship, if you take every part of your life and go, Lord, this is, part of your, this is part of my life. As a matter of fact, I would say the maturity of a Christ follower is every area of our lives is given over more and more to God. And we say, Lord, I give it to you. Lord, I give it to you because ultimately it's yours anyway. Right? The time that I have, the talents that you've given me, and by talents, just to be, I want you to be clear something, servant. Right? Servant's heart. And finally, the treasure. You know, when I, when I break down, you know, our giving, our, our accountant does this for me, but like, you know, hey, we see that, you know, we have young adults who are giving, we have people who are older, we have, mid, you know, like everybody. Like, it just, it just, it just, it's even across the board. That's kind of what I think it's supposed to be. You know, we never really talk about our mission statement. You know why we don't talk about our mission statement? No one really cares. But I'm going to tell you it anyway, just because, hey, why not? Our mission statement is this. Reaching the lost, discipling the found. That's it, right? We are the type of church that really we want to go out and we want, we want people to come to UCC who are, A, looking for a church that maybe goes a little bit deeper, maybe helps them to kind of understand the Bible a bit better, but also are getting to get to know people as well too. Again, community. But we also want to be this idea of discipling as well too. And discipling happens a whole bunch of different ways. Discipling happens Sunday morning when I, with my teaching. I know that you think to yourself, like, here's the thing I get all the time. There's a lot of content, right? That's a lot of information. I understand that. But the reason I do that is because I want you to understand. Whenever I preach a sermon on a Sunday morning, there's three types of people I'm, I'm preaching to. One, people have grown up in the church. Hopefully, if you've grown up in the church, I'm going to show you something that perhaps you did not know. Hopefully. Two, there are people who attend our church that actually don't believe in Jesus or don't believe in the Bible, don't, are not even Christians. But they attend here because hopefully I'm helping them to kind of reframe their worldview and they come to UCC. And the third group that I try to speak to is the people who are, how do I say this in a nice way? Dead but don't know it. Right? Dead but don't know it. I'm, I'm hoping to try to revive you a little bit to have that excitement and that joy again. See, Christianity is many things, but for me it's terrifying. Because when I think about Moses being sent to the uh, Pharaoh, when I think of the, uh, the Israelites going into the promised land, these are not things people go, oh, this is going to be fun. Like, it's the unknown. What does God want from me? What is God going to do in me? What is God going to do through me? And just so you know, I don't feel qualified for most of it most of the time. You ever heard the phrase imposter syndrome? I might be the poster child for that. Like when I planted at UCC, like I, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just making this up as I go, right? I feel like imposter syndrome all the time. But it's interesting about imposter syndrome with the Holy Spirit is you kind of just how things just all fall together. God brings people alongside you and like, okay, it's all it's kind of working out. Let me close here. I'm gonna put a lot of words on the screen. I wanna explain to you what I wanna read to you. Back when I was first dreaming up UCC, not only did I read the book of Acts, but I read something called um, the Early Church Fathers. These are writings that came up around the first and second century of the church. Here's the reason why. By the time the third century comes along, Constantine's taken over the church and things go off the rails. But pre-Constantinian, or what we call the Anti-Nicene Fathers, all this writing came up about what Christianity looked like. And what's remarkable to me is that in this 300 years before Constantine takes over was this rich and vibrant view of what it meant to be a Christ follower. They got things wrong all the time. But they were wrestling with it, right? And what was amazing about the early church is that you see men and women together preaching and teaching and apostling and, and planting and, and, and figuring things out. Men and women all together, all over the place. There's a particular letter I want to read to you. It's called the, uh, the, uh, the Epistle to Dionetus. This is a letter uh, that is written to somebody, uh, and they're trying to convince this individual about what Christianity is. The letter was written in 130, uh, 130 AD. So 130 AD, so uh, you know, within the first, second century of the early church. This letter wrecked me. And the reason it wrecked me is that what I'm going to show you, and there's going to be lots of words on the screen. Don't worry, I'm going to read them for you. But what wrecked me about this is he's trying to explain to somebody, what does it mean to be a Christian? 
And it's these words that haunted me because these are the words that I used to think to myself. When I ask somebody what it means to be a Christian, all these words that come out of their mouth. Oh, you Christians are... And I go, wow. But the early church lived in a hostile political environment. The people hated them. People killed them. And yet, somehow, some way, the gospel seemed to go out. So I'm going to read uh, a, a bit for you. And again, lots of words. Relax. For the Christians are distinguished from other men, neither by country nor language, nor the customs by which they observe. For they, they neither inhabit cities of their own, nor employ a, partic- a peculiar form of speech, nor, nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. The course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men, nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of of any uh, merely human doctrines. But inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, according as the lot of each of them has been determined, and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of the ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things with others, and yet endure all things as foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. So just want to give you a little uh, context here. So the letter to Dionysus, he's trying to explain to me what it means to be a Christ follower. What's a Christian? He's saying, well, okay, a Christian's not a political thing. A Christian's not an ethnic thing. A Christian's not a gender thing. So he's trying to remove all these labels that Roman culture would have put upon somebody. Look what he goes on to say. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They're unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, yet abound in all. They are dishonored, yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They, they are evil spoken of and yet are justified. They are reviled and blessed. They are insulted and repay the insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened to life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and persecuted by the Greeks, yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. If you ever get a chance, read this letter. I've just given you, I know, lots of words, but he goes on to talk about it. And what's amazing about this is that when I think about what the vitality of being a Christ follower was, this is what we're trying to get back to at UCC. See, I don't think we're perfect. I don't think we have everything figured out. And we've gone through some pretty interesting times, a pandemic, and, and really we're seeing right now our culture, as it becomes more secular, is more and more intolerant to a Christ follower who has a certain set of beliefs that would be very antithetical to the rest of culture. And as Christ followers, we're trying to figure out, okay, what does it mean to live in this world, but you know, not live in the culture, but also still be honoring to what, the, what God wants for us and what the Bible tells us? Well, what I love about this letter and what I love about the early church is they showed us it's possible. They showed us that it was possible. Let me close with a passage from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, just a quick note here. Peter was the missionary to the Hebrew people. He uses something that's actually sacrilegious here. He says to his readers, you are all a holy priesthood. Now remember, the priesthood to the Jewish people were the Levites. But Peter's going to say something now. He's going to say, you know what? Those of you who are in Christ, those of you who are knit together, you are all priests. You are all pastors. He goes on to say this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priest, and a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, 
but now you're a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now have you received mercy. See, I will say this about whatever it means to be a Christ follower. If you decide that you want to follow Jesus, and I always, I always use the phrase, if. Well, then that means then your entire life changes. Your relationships change, your thinking change, your worldview changes, how you see people, how you see yourself, how you understand the brokenness in the world. We are a peculiar people. And we serve a peculiar God. That God has decided to allow Jesus to be seen in us and through us to people who will never step foot in this church. And for 2024, I have been thinking about what that means for us. Well, look, what does it mean for us to be that for everyone else? And the reason I just want to kind of go through the whole UCC vision thing, and again, for some of you, that might be the first time you've heard that. But for others of you who are part of UCC, that's been there since the beginning. It kind of dictates how we operate. It kind of tells us how we function as a church, as a community. I used to say this about our church, that we are small but feisty. We are intentionally small, just so you know. We, that, is, that is baked into who, how, how we understand because we believe that relationships are important. We don't want to become a church of any size where people can get lost. We think that part's kind of important. Small church is part of how we are. It's funny, I, when I talk to pastor friends of mine, so how many people go to your church? Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, maybe God will do something and you'll have a bigger church. I'm like, yeah, then we'll have to plant another one then if that happens. When, when God taps Moses and says, hey, I need you to go and take the people across the Jordan, I think to myself, God's tapping us on the shoulder, 2024. We don't know what 2024 is, and I don't know what 2024 is, is going to be like either. I like to think I have an idea. Maybe not. What is God going to ask you to do this year that might scare you a little bit? What might God ask you to do this year? What might God ask you to surrender this year? What might God ask you to become, to inhabit, to release, to surrender? It's the unknown country. It's the unknown, it's beyond the Jordan. But I love that video clip there when God says to Moses, you know what, I'm sending you, but I'm going with you. Whatever God's gonna call you for this year, whatever promise, whatever suffering, whatever, whatever happens this year, God goes with you. It's not unknown to him. Every day until he returns has been mapped out. It's incumbent upon us to be faithful until he returns. Let's bow our heads. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We were supposed to celebrate communion today, but um, I realized this morning when I got here that we didn't have enough communion supplies, so we're going to do it next week. Let me ask you a question as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, and we do this just for reflection, for meditation. I just want you to know something. 2024 is a blank page. And we don't know what will fill that page up. We just, we just don't know. But what we do know is God is faithful. And whatever we experience, whatever we go through, whatever happens to us, happens with us, God by his Holy Spirit can use that for our transformation for our development, for our maturity. And my hope and my prayer for UCC this next year is that we'll see some areas of growth that I'm looking into, that we'll see some areas of, of development that we need as well too. We as a community are incomplete, and we'll always be incomplete. That's the good part. I'm delighted that God has brought us some people that are going to help us as a community to continue to grow, help us in worship, like just whatever God has for us, he's, he has provided. And then I have to say to you, since day one of UCC, God has always provided. My hope and my prayer is that whatever your journey, whatever your story is, that you would take your time, your talent, your treasure, and say, Lord, this belongs to you anyways. How do I best serve the kingdom? 
How do I best serve my brothers and sisters? How do I best serve those outside of these walls? Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are faithful. Lord, I, when I think about the audacity you had to tap Moses on the shoulder, when I think about all the times you've put your people in uncomfortable positions, situations, so that they may grow, so that they may rely upon you, so that they would realize that apart from you, we can do nothing. Holy Spirit, I pray for 2024 for all of us. I pray for us as a community. I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to grow, to believe, be, to be transformed in small and in great ways. Lord, I pray for victories for some in this room here. Lord, for those who have struggled with something for a while, I pray, Holy Spirit, that 2024 would be a time of victory in certain areas. God, I pray that in all of us, you would continue to mature and develop and grow within us the character and nature of Jesus. And Lord, for the needs that we have as a community, I pray, God, and I thank you that you have provided, that you would continue to provide for us. Lord, we love you, and we are so thankful that you first loved us. Spirit of the Most High God, walk with us into 2024. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.